A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, how do you stand in a church at your grandfather's funeral and eulogize him, tell the world that he was like a father to you, that he made you the man you are today, and then police arrest you for the murder of your grandfather. I'm fairly certain that grandpa, who was a deacon in that very church, did not raise that young man to be a suspected killer. But first, two sisters who turned to TikTok for help in apprehending their fugitive father, who is accused of sexually assaulting them. Well, they finally got him arrested, and now more victims are coming forward. We are recording this on Wednesday, February 21st of 2024. Our guest today is Rachel Fassay, an accomplished attorney specializing in white collar criminal defense, government investigations, and other complex litigation. Rachel is also frequently seen as a commentator on these high profile crime issues. So happy to see you again, Rachel. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, Anna. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited that you're here to discuss these two cases. You know, they they they're all about family, really. You know, I talk about crime being the, being something where um, it they're they're like it's how people make decisions to solve their problems. You know, n- excluding of course crimes of passion, but you know people are are trying to get insurance money or they're in a dispute or it's a divorce i mean there's always something going on it's an interpersonal problem that often leads to a crime and so in these two cases it's all about family Mm -hmm. it is and these are both seemingly tragic cases, uh, particularly if the facts that are coming forward are true and that the family members are guilty of the acts that they're accused of. So this this is both uh, younger, we have a younger, we have younger children and we have a grandchild um, against their family members, a grandfather and a father. So this is exploring family relationships and how they can really go wrong. Mm -hmm. And again, these cases are very new in the sense that these arrests just happened. The the charges have just been filed. And whether or not um, these suspects have entered any pleas yet, we always say to everyone, remember, you are innocent until proven guilty. These alleg- these are the allegations against them. Um, these are the crimes in which they are charged with. And in one of the cases, a very you know serious case, we have someone who has been murdered. So the question will be, you know, do they have the right person? So let's start with our first case. Both cases, by the way, are out of Florida. Our first case is out of Central Florida, where two daughters took their pleas to TikTok and to the TV show America's Most Wanted. Well, they're feeling just a little bit more of justice today. Their father, whom they accuse of sexually abusing them and other family members, has been arrested. It's all because of this relentless campaign that the two sisters waged on social media and their tips and their information that they either gathered themselves out there searching, going from motel room to motel room, following up on tips, talking to family members, all of this, they were able to help police locate where their father was hiding. And that's what made the arrest possible. What's interesting about this, Rachel, is they started, you know, the telling of their story on social media. And it took a while. And then once people started listening and hearing them and seeing them, they've had, they've had millions of views and then news organizations started contacting them and then covering the case. And so I, I really applaud these two young women because they did not give up and they told their story directly, not only to anyone who would listen, but it made it impossible for police to look away. 
It's so interesting, this story. There are multiple, multiple TikToks that they were making. There's a story arc to the TikToks. They have millions of viewers, some of these, these TikToks. And it is really about, to me, sexual abuse victims taking their power back, not hiding in the corner regarding what happened to them, not being embarrassed about their father, and really trying to uplift themselves out of the abuse situation they're in and, and be the survivors that they are and show the world that, th that other survivors um, can take their power back. So I find this story really fascinating from the girl's viewpoint as it's even about their father and they're taking their power back from their father. And there are even TikToks showing their relationship with their father beforehand and after they're aware of the abuse. So it really is um, a, a fascinating story with what they would see as a potentially just end, which was finding him. Absolutely. And I am, you know, a lot of times, well, well, I should say this, we've seen a lot of changes over the years where uh, victims and survivors are finally being taken more seriously. And, and what they did here was they went to police, they filed their complaints, and they were taken seriously. In fact, police went looking for the man and there was an outstanding warrant for him, which then made it possible for other agencies to be on the lookout for him. And um, that's a really important part of this, that they they not only told their story, but they also went to police and said, look, this is what we say has happened. You need to find him, you need to arrest him. And then of course the justice system will decide if indeed he has committed these crimes. So um, the whole process has taken years. They, they've been telling their story for a long time and then, a lot changed. I mean, I do believe in many ways, of course, TikTok is the strongest platform that they had. However, when they managed to tell their story on America's Most Wanted, the, the classic television show dedicated to finding um, people who were wanted, there was a big turn there. Um, there they, they really, within a week, he was arrested. So it's, it's very telling how um, this accelerated so much in the last few weeks. So let's get to the accused here. He is 51-year-old Davy Albaran, and he's been charged with two counts of sexual battery on a child under 12. This is relating to two separate incidents. His daughters, Anna and Yaniri Albaran, use social media to share these personal stories of abuse, they say, at the hands of their father. And they, they urged anyone who could help to help. But what what unfolded here, especially in the latest TikToks after the arrest, it's very interesting to hear the daughters say they're accusing other family members of actually helping to keep the father hidden. And, you know, they're naming relatives. And the other thing that they um, are very upset about, and I get this, especially if it's true, these two young women have been fighting the fight for years, without question. And now they say other family members are trying to claim, you know, th that they should be rewarded, that they are the ones who helped to find him and they're furious because the two girls are like, really, where have you been this whole time? Hmm. So there's, there, there's a lot of family drama going on there, but I really hear that indignity. I mean, I mean, really, you, you fight this fight, you put everything out there, very sensitive things that are general, you know, about yourself, about your family, and then someone else tries to claim that they're the ones who solve this. The girls really drove the case. They're, they were driving the finding. They were brave enough to come forward and then brave enough to make it public. 
and use TikTok and other social media as the platform, putting out their stories. And now because they did that, there was some fame involved. Yeah. And so they became more high profile, which now the other family members would like to hop on that bandwagon at the end of this without the brave acts and, and take some sort of credit. I mean, this is, there's so much, there's so much that goes on into in domestic abuse and sexual abuse cases um, relating to family members, belief aspects and um, whose side family members are taking. And I think everybody in the beginning may traditionally be reluctant to believe that sexual abuse is happening. So in some ways, you're actually watching this play out in a very public way. Um, so once the the girls got the public on board with their belief and in looking for their father, then the family members are joining that bandwagon. I, can, I can't, um, that is in no way an excuse for the family members. Um, and again, the facts will play out in court and, and we'll see how that goes. These are allegations, but you're watching what may have traditionally <laughs> happened, but you're watching it all in this really incredibly public forum. Exactly, you're watching these family dynamics in real time being revealed and shared in a very public manner. And, um, there's a part of me that really appreciates that and, and appreciates the frankness and this feeling of, you know, hold on a second. We have been making this argument for years. Not everyone would listen to us. And now at the very end, you know, you're the one who wants to claim that you're the one who, who brought this guy to justice. Come on now. Where were you when I told you, when I told you my crime? when I told you what had happened to me. So I, I, I really, there's something about that that truly resonated with me. Um, and, you know, everyone, the, the, the sheriff's involved because the, you know, the arrest warrant was out of one county. He was arrested in another. The U.S. Marshals were obviously looking for him. He was a fugitive. Everyone was looking for him. But at the end of the day, it's these two young women, these survivors, who are truly responsible for getting to this point injustice. Whether they'll get full justice, I don't know. But truly, it's it's all their hard work that got them to this point. And, and, and thank you also to the police for taking them seriously, because let's get, let's start this a little bit. Let's go back a little bit in time. So in December of 2022, that is when the two daughters, the two young women, went to the police and um, told them what had happened. And then the police filed the reports and went looking for their father. And he was already gone by the time police got to where they thought he was staying. And that's what, you know, list, that's when the warrant was put out and everyone was looking for him. But the question is, where is he? What's fascinating is that one of the daughters shared that through this years long process, that she had staked out all of these different motels and hotels in Florida, trying to see if she could find where he was hiding. It turns out he was apparently, according to police, staying with family members and friends. And then at one of the ho hotels, motels that she was looking at, he actually had stayed, but was under a different name. I mean, it's just amazing the amount of work that these two young women put into this. So once the father has now escaped in the sense that police just cannot find him, the arrest warrant is out there, police can't find him, the storytelling on TikTok really goes into high gear. And again, millions of views. Here's one of those clips. I believe sh you gotta stay. Do not have a plan on my kid. I know. I know, but I will never do that. I don't believe I you. I, mean, I, I don't hold believe up. anybody in the world. I don't trust never. nobody. I don't trust nobody when it comes to my children. Why do you think I have a camera in their room? Why do you think I got a thing in their front door? Yeah, but that's not me. The only way I, I turn it off is when I was sick, and you know that I told you. I don't believe anything anybody has to say. How dare you? Yeah, I don't, don't say I, I, How dare you? I didn't have to fucking say that. No. How dare you? I don't believe really you got to say. 
I don't believe you. Admit it for the first time, stop fing lying about something. You're always lying about shit. You know how fucking you know you lie about this? You're lying about this. And I don't care what you gotta say. This is my fing daughter. She's not gonna lie to me about something. She was literally crying to me, telling me. She told me, she told me the exact date was the first time. On the date. That she told me September 23rd. She was writing down every fing time. At this point, the sisters can no longer be ignored. And as we said, news organizations start paying attention. They start making the reports locally in central Florida, which of course gets the pressure up on police, but it also makes it possible for other members in the community who may not be following this on TikTok mm -hmm. to be aware, to be on the lookout for, and that this case is going on in their community. So then on February 12th of this year, they finally get featured on the TV show, America's Most Wanted. Here's a clip. How difficult was it for you to discover this information about your father? The most heartbreaking thing I've ever had to deal with in my life. I had to be strong for my child while I was breaking down, you know, on the inside. Every day I'd be crying. I couldn't even tell her till days later because I felt like I failed my child, you know? And I just didn't even know how to speak up about it out loud. I couldn't believe that I was going through something like this. I couldn't believe my child was dealing with something like this. Do you think there could be other victims out there potentially? I think possibly there is because when I posted him on social media, I was flooded with DMs of other people that allegedly said that he had also victimized them as children. Like my worst nightmare is that I don't catch him in time and then he hurts someone else. What a coward. You're way braver than him, way stronger. Thank you so much. And his daughter, she was so happy, her child. She's like, we did it. Like when she knew he was sorry. Literally the night before we came out here, she was just so happy that we were even gonna be on the show. What's amazing to me, Rachel, is that a week later in Lakeland, Florida on February 18th, authorities say that they receive a tip and they arrest Davey, the father, at a location where when they arrived, we're being told by the daughters, he tried to jump out a window as police were banging on the doors. So, I mean, that's pretty amazing. It is amazing. And it's amazing to me that through all of the TikTok videos, it was still America's Most Wanted that really brought it home. And I think it is a, a such a aside from the case, an interesting commentary on use of the media, that social media got them to the point where America's Most Wanted was interested, but it was still the traditional means of getting a fugitive um, in some ways that, that led to his arrest and to them finding him. And again, I cannot help but go back to the power of the girls and to them putting their energy from the pain that they have suffered into the relentless pursuit of, of their father. Mm -hmm. Police say that he was hiding in a shed and allegedly gave officers a fake name claiming he was somebody else. Um, he, according to the sheriff, he was thinking of making a run for it until he saw the canines, which can quickly change someone's mind about doing anything because those are very tough trained animals. So the Osceola Sheriff, Marcos Lopez, thanked Anna and her sister, as he said, for their bravery, for sharing their story, and for being persistent and helping us get this guy off the streets, right? This was a partnership here. Mm -hmm. The sisters said on WFTV that they are grateful to all of the strangers who helped them. Here's a clip. I just appreciate everybody for the part they played in it this. It took millions of people to get them. People that didn't even know us. The father appeared before a judge in an orange jumpsuit. He certainly is not running away anytime soon. At the time of this recording, the father has not yet entered a plea as far as we know. He's currently being held at the Polk County Jail, awaiting transport to the Osceola County Jail where he will face charges. So a lot of moving parts right now, and we will know more. But again, we always say, 
innocent until proven guilty. Now, in addition to the charges of sexual battery on a child under 12 and lewd conduct on a child under 12, the father also faces unrelated charges of failure to pay child support in Orange County, Florida. So, should be a very interesting case. Our next case is also out of Florida, where a young man who spoke at his grandfather's funeral is now charged with killing his grandfather. This is out of Port Charlotte, Florida. The victim here is 71-year-old James Corey. He was shot outside his home, though James was retired. He worked and he volunteered as a deacon at the First Baptist Church in his neighborhood, and he and his wife, Linda, you know, had a routine every morning. I was reading the arrest warrant. You know, usually in arrest warrants, it's just the facts, right? As it should be, of course. But sometimes there are details of a person's life that remind you while you're reading details of ballistics, forensics, timing, GPS, all that stuff, right? It's, it's very scientific. It's very clinical. It isn't warm. You will find bits and pieces of a human being, which reminds you, again, this is a human life that has been lost. And I was so deeply touched by how his wife, Linda, told the officers, and they included in their report, that they had a routine. Every single morning, she would walk him to the door, kiss him goodbye, hand him his lunchbox, and he'd, you know, walk out to his vehicle and drive off for the day. And I thought to myself, wow, that is so sweet. You're in your 70s and every single morning you do not lose sight of the kiss and the goodbye, right? Very touching. And yet this man has been murdered. Their, their life, their marriage shattered. Yeah. Oh, it just breaks my heart. So on this morning with his little lunch box in his hand, kisses his wife, say goodbye, door closes. And she tells the police, I, I heard this shot. Then I hear, uh, I hear him. He calls out to his wife. He calls his wife. And then she hears a thud. She runs out there. She sees that he's been shot. She goes inside the house, calls 911. According to court records, she then calls their grandson, who lives very close by, less than half a mile down a little wooded path that I guess maybe connects the property, so it makes it a very quick trip back and forth. And it makes sense, right? You're going to call the closest relative, right, when something horrible has happened. It makes perfect sense. So their grandson, 23-year-old Joshua Nero shows up. Police arrive on the scene. This is all unfolding very early in the morning. This is December 28th, so it's between Christmas and New Year's of last year, 2023, and authorities say that when they arrived at the Corey home just after 5.15 a.m., that's when they found James on his back in front of their home with a gunshot wound to the chest. What they did not know until they got the forensics back was, it's not that he was shot in the chest. Police say he was shot in the back and that the bullet exited the front. That is very disturbing to me. It's very disturbing. It shows what they believe he was walking to his car, having just kissed his wife. Um, walking to his car and and was shot on his way. So he would have never known perhaps who shot him. And that may show the work of a family member who is close that he didn't want his grandfather to know. It's it's an interesting thing, but it, it was obvious somebody might have known this routine um, each day, what happened and had been waiting knowing exactly where he would walk um, and when he would walk to the car. Now, police took their time in, in arresting the grandson because it was almost a month later. However, as I keep reviewing 
at least the evidence which police have shared. And I always say this, you know, we only know a fraction of things. We can't know it all. Sometimes they will present evidence that appears to be very strong. And then there's some evidence which you say, hmm. And in this case, I, I have to say, because again, we don't know everything, but the evidence that they're presenting, I'm, I'm not sure. It's strong. It's not that strong is what I'm going to say, Rachel. Um, I'll get into it, but I want all of you to think, how, how do you feel? Do you, do you think this evidence was strong enough to make an arrest? And of course, you know, a court is going to make this decision and a jury is going to make this decision. And we do not know all the pieces here. We don't, we don't know all the pieces. So as the deputies searched the scene that morning, of course, they noticed that he was carrying, James was carrying his lunchbox. Um, you know, he had his keys, he had his wallet. So it's not like he was held up. So that, so that was obvious, even though they were still trying to figure everything out. The other thing that they noticed was that James had, um, oh, he was carrying a gun that was holstered on him, uh, which he had not attempted to remove in any way. So they're pretty clear that it was unlikely that it was an accident or something else involving his own weapon, simply because it was still holstered. So there's that, you know, he was armed. Had he seen his assailant coming, don't you think Rachel Lee would have taken action? I do, which I think in some ways might explain if it's somebody who knows this man that he does walk around with a gun that, uh, and there, there may be an explanation here that's more nefarious than he just walks around with a gun. However, s someone may have known that and that's why they shot him in the back. So he didn't see who was coming at him. Um, and so there isn't a self, you know, there was not an action in self-defense that the police, I think, are saying at this moment because he's just, as far as we know, doing his daily morning routine um, after leaving his wife and going to his car at 5.15 in the morning. And it is dark at 5.15 in the morning. Mm -hmm. It is really dark. So that's another aspect. And apparently, because of the location and everything like that, so far, it has not been revealed that there are any surveillance cameras that may have picked anything up, which I find very interesting because oftentimes it's the marriage of digital forensics, physical forensics, and then the surveillance cameras, which are part of the digital, but I I'm talking about like phones, GPS, all that stuff, which does come into play here. So... Police interviewed both the wife and the grandson at the scene because obviously the grandson is there. Now, Joshua allegedly told deputies that he was in bed, home, watching YouTube. Okay, it's five in the morning. It's very, you know, young people are always up, <laughs> you know, they're nocturnal, as they say. So very, very possible, right? But that's what he said. He was watching YouTube in bed and that his grandma called him and said that grandpa had been shot and he ran right over. And that explained why he was there, which I think is a very reasonable explanation. So then, according to the arrest warrant, um, you know, Josh was explaining that he, uh, there's this path between the two homes that's wooded, and that's how he gets back and forth to grandma and grandpa's house quickly. It's the shortest distance. So he allegedly, this is the grandson allegedly consented to a search of his home by authorities, and then they found multiple weapons there. And then the medical examiner finally concluded their investigation, and they said that the 71-year-old died of a gunshot wound that perforated his lung and his heart, and they determined that James had been shot in the back, and it exited, the bullet exited the chest, and the manner of death was deemed a homicide. So this is, you know, a few days later. So now police know for sure, without question, that they're dealing with a homicide here. They also found, um, police say that they found a bullet, bullet fragments in a pine tree. This is what I want to talk to you about is this pine tree. Now, we, um, because the bullet exited, I guess we don't have the bullet that killed him. The question is, is the bullet in the pine tree the bullet that killed him or not? It wasn't clear to me from the arrest warrant, so it could be. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. My question to you is this. 
for them to find that bullet in the pine tree, which presumably could be the bullet that killed him. And there are so many forensics that take a very long time to get the results on. They said because of where the bullet was in the tree, they made the determination that the shooter, based on how James was found, most likely came from the direction of that wooded path between the two homes. Mm -hmm. So I say to you, a bullet in a pine tree, how strong is this evidence to you? I think this is really, this really requires the forensic analysis, like a deep, good forensic analysis that probably had not been done at the time of the arrest warrant. So where is the bullet? And what you, you're, this is what the trial looks like if there's a defense as to the bullet is they're drawing a line from where the alleged shooter was to the tree and where uh, Mr. Corey was found. So that that's that it's incredibly important, the location of the bullet, because you have to have a plausible explanation. Um, if it's high up in the tree, then you're assuming the the there it must have been an angle and was that angle even possible so it, it the bullet is an incredibly uh important piece of evidence and its location and and we i don't think we know enough to know where it was found in a tree and what the trajectory must have been although they're saying well they must it must have been shot from one part of the property to the other to be found in the tree but i don't think that gives us enough to explain where everybody was when it when that bullet was fired. Yeah, very interesting. And that's really what I, I, I thank you for that, Rachel, because I needed some clarity there. I wanted to understand, you know, the significance of this and, and what it will look like going forward and and how much we're really missing, which of course we only have a portion of the investigation made public here. So then authorities, after the retrieval of this bullet and the results of the medical examiner's investigation, authorities obtained a search warrant for Joshua's cell phone. Now they claim based on the data recordings that were logged in his cell phone, and they were interesting, they were saying it wasn't exactly GPS, it was, it was another background app that was picking up steps right how it's more about walking as opposed to driving oftentimes you know the gps is like oh i'm an hour away well why were you there so this is a much shorter distance so my question to you is so authorities are saying in the arrest warrant that based on the data of footsteps and steps taken it appears that the phone presumably joshua with it were, that he was not in bed and at home, but was actually close to the crime scene. And the timestamps, according to police, place him at the time of the shooting, near the shooting, as opposed to being home. That it, it's what he is saying does not appear to line up with this part of the digital forensics. What's your opinion here? Yeah, so I think this evidence is pretty bad for Joshua. I think this is the evidence that probably put them over the edge um, as it relates to what they're seeing. So it, it appears that Joshua, if he did murder his grandfather, was he brought his phone along and he brought his phone on that path, went back, uh, back home and then came back um, and so they're seeing all of these steps. And the, the biggest issue here is it doesn't line up with what he told investigators at the scene. What he told them at the scene was that he was in bed. And so now, right, right just there, even if you can prove he was stepping somewhere else, you have a lack of credibility when they get this phone evidence showing all of these steps when he said he wasn't up, that he was in bed. So regardless, and I don't think the GPS app at this point, I don't think we know that it's clear. It hasn't placed an exact trail as to where he was. It has counted a bunch of steps and it's showing that he was up. Um, and so that is one of the reasons I have to say they, they would have arrested him. And this evidence probably could get worse for him, even from where we are now. Police say that once they 
found this information that said contradicted his initial statement to police. Police went back to Joshua, confronted him about this tracking data, and Joshua allegedly said to the police he could not give them an explanation to that. Okay, then on January 4th, the the preliminary ballistics report comes back from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So investigators there say that the bullet retrieved from the pine tree, and we're back to that tree, is pretty consistent with a 3030 bolt action rifle that is similar to the rifle that Joshua owns. And of course, further ballistics testing will determine more there. So here we have um, an, another clue lining up. So, but they don't make an arrest yet because this poor man hasn't even been buried yet. So a few days later on January 7th, finally, the community fills a church. They go there to honor someone they loved who led them in that church, James Corey's funeral. It's huge. If you look at the video on YouTube, this church is huge and it is packed with people. And and so many people came up to speak about him and how he was the first one in the church in the morning, the first one to make sure everything is set up, the first one to help. He even taught Sunday school. I mean, just the most lovely picture is painted of this man. And they did this um, photo montage at the beginning of the funeral where you see him with all his family members, you know, just, just a rich, rich life and a man rich with love. So his grandson, Joshua spoke at the funeral. It is actually such a short speech. We can play it in its entirety for you. Here it is. Jim, I called him Grampy. Um, By blood was my grandfather. As a person, he was my father. He helped raise me. He made me the person I am today. Um, You are all here because you knew and loved my grandfather, and I thank you so much for that. Um, He taught me to stand here, be tall, be strong. My goal in life is to be as good as this man was. He helped everyone in this room in some way, and I know that. I just want to thank everyone again for being here. I love all of you. Thank you again. He says he made him the person he is today. You know, I was raised by my grandfather, and he re- I really am the person. The person I am today is because of my grandfather. Without question, he raised me. So I was actually very touched by that because that's that really resonates with me personally. And, you know, he was very nervous and uncomfortable as, as he's up there. If you if anyone here has ever spoken at a funeral, you know, it is it's a very difficult time for people. Right. Especially if you love the person. But Rachel, what do we make of this eulogy given by the grandson given the fact that a month after this, he gets arrested for his grandfather's murder. Well, Anna, I'm going to take a little bit different spin than you have, because what I think may tip the scales on this case is whatever the motive is. And I don't think we have been given the motive. I don't know if the police have gone down that line yet, but what is going what we are going to understand at some point is if uh, the grandson did this, if he, if Joshua did this, why he did this, because it likely won't be for no reason um, that he will. There will be some reason, whether it makes sense or is reasonable. Of course, it, it's never reasonable. But what what if there is a pattern of abuse or if there is something relating to his grandfather Um, we will understand it. If he's doing it for money, we will understand it. But I think in light of understanding that there could have been a motive if he is indeed the shooting, that is a very interesting eulogy if you think of it that way. This man made me who I am today and who I am today is a man who shoots his grandfather. And if, if, if that is 
if, if we're looking inside of Joshua's brain, I wonder what that means once it all comes out at the end of the day as it relates to this case. And we've seen a pattern here in several cases that we've covered on the podcast where someone disappears and the person ultimately either arrested and or convicted of that person's murder was there as part of the search team, consoling the family members, um, leading the charge to find the person, discovering the person. It's a, uh, it's most interesting pattern. Again, we don't know here innocent until proven guilty. And it's very, as you can imagine, this has absolutely rocked this community and this church, this community of faith, because based on, on what police have said so far, and they've even said that they know how disturbing this is to the community. You have family member turned on family member, church member turned on church member. It's very upsetting. It is very upsetting. Um, Joshua is currently being held in the Charlotte County Jail without bond. He has a court hearing scheduled for today. Everything's happening today when we're recording this podcast. (laughs) This is very active in the justice system. We're on it, people. Um, so if there's any information on that, um, of course, we'll always pin it to uh, our our YouTube video on all of this. But for now, at the time of this recording, this is all we know. So we will be following this case carefully. It is time for our comments section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. Here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna, how's it going? Great. Good to see you, Rachel. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much. Okay, so this case, uh, if you're familiar with Breaking Bad, this is kind of the sequel, I guess, but it's Breaking Dumb, I would call it. Uh, this case comes out of Ronkonkoma, New York. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Is that Ronkonkoma. right? Ronkonkoma. Ronkonkoma, New York. Ronk- it's all in the pronunciation. Ronkonkoma. Ronkonkoma. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Go on. Uh, this one is of where the few things comes... I know growing up in New York, Ronkonkoma <laughs> Station. <laughs> <laughs> this is where that one, this case comes out of, uh, where a 23-year-old is headed to prison after he unknowingly exposed his own drug lab last year, which he was operating as a legitimate business. What kind so, of business? A, a laboratory. Uh, like quite literally a laboratory. Um, so the suspect here, uh, Matthew Lashinsky, pleaded guilty to the unlawful manufacture of methamphetamine, among some other drug-related charges. Now, this comes after authorities seized around $40,000 in cash, along with a stash of MDMA. They didn't say exactly how much there. Not, not sure if some of them went missing on its way to evidence, but a stash of MDMA, uh, along with three ounces of meth, 625 grams of pure ketamine, and 20 plastic drums, each containing around 55 gallons of GBL, which is similar to, to GHB, which you know, we don't, not a great drug. Yeah, no. a lot of stuff there. A lot of stuff going on there. So this all came together after after Matthew, the suspect here himself, called 911 in the early hours of June 7th of 2023 to report a burglary at this lab, which uh, authorities pointed out he was trying to pass off as a legitimate business. It was called Quantitative Laboratories, LLC. I guess he even got his business license and whole deal for this. Um, so officers arrive on the scene to this report of a burglary. They saw a broken glass at what pretty clearly appeared to be like a laboratory. Um, But this wasn't a normal laboratory. Authorities are saying they've called it a Walter White-esque drug laboratory. So they discovered this broken broken glass. They're going through the lab here. Um, It's pretty easy, apparently, for officers to tell that this is some sort of clandestine operation specifically designed for the manufacture of methamphetamine and other controlled substances. They searched this lab. They uncovered over 100 pieces of lab equipment, including like chemicals and solvents, which are pretty specifically and pointedly used in the manufacture, production, and preparation of methamphetamine and other drugs. Um, So not looking great for this guy. Like I said, he pleaded guilty to these drug-related charges uh, and is expected to appear in court again on March 20th for sentencing. Um, I I just have so many questions about this actual burglary. Like, did somebody try to break in? Was he trying to get an insurance thing? I like, it's, it's really unclear what would motivate you to call the cops on this situation? Uh, I don't know if perhaps he was had to test some of the product. I I really don't know. Um, It doesn't seem that all that bright though, Um, which our our viewers echoed in the comments monger. uh, YT said, he really called the police to say somebody tried stealing my drugs, except he literally gave them the address of his meth lab. 
Yes, very, very <laughs> ironic here. I, 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 best case scenario, like what are the police doing here? They show up, let's say they catch somebody in the act of stealing this meth that you're supposedly manufacturing. They're gonna give it back. I, I don't really know what the thought process was there. Unless it, of course um, you're using some of the stuff that you're manufacturing and you're not right? thinking clearly. Yeah, I think there might be. Yeah, I think there might have been something going on there with uh, just just making sure this this stuff was up to snuff. Uh, Allison R said, "When you're trying to make it big, like Walt, meaning Walter White, break you back, but also jonesing to get on True Crime Daily, folks. If you want to get on the show, you just gotta send us a comment. You don't you don't have to do anything crazy like this. All invited, please join yes, us. Yes, yes, absolutely. Anna is 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 dying to have you on this show. Oh my God, um, totally." <laughs> Uh, Tim B with one of our favorite puns comes up a lot, but they said he methed up. Perfect. Mm, yeah. Good one. Yes. It always works. It always works. Uh, and volume size uh, is impressed with the police work here. They said, who are you going to call? Meth busters. Mm-hmm. There they you got go. it. They got wow. it. Um, Amazing. So that, I have a question. Yes. Has nothing to do with anything, but just because you're here. Of course. Is anyone here watching True Detective? Because I don't want to. It, the finale just happened, so I'm not going to reveal anything. Will, I'm, do you I'm, watch it? I'm only two episodes in, but I'm, I'm trying to catch up. The I'm reason I say up. that is I've been watching this show, and it's been driving me crazy who Pryor, the, the, the young officer, looks like. It's mm -hmm. you. You are the one. You look like Pryor. It's been driving. I've been watching this. I'm saying, this man reminds me of someone. I'm like, it's Will. <laughs> anyway, I'll that's just it. me. That's just I'll me. Yeah, he's Jodie Foster's son in the show, right? Uh, no, the other guy's son. Oh, not Jodie Foster's the, son. Yeah, John but, Hawks. Yeah, but it, it, she's mentoring him in her very rough way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I what mean, an ending! I'm not going to say anything else. I'm not going to say anything else because it's very controversial out there. Very controversial. Very controversial. Yeah, I know people are uh, up in arms about the old, uh, about the old True Detective. Yeah, I was. I loved it though. I gotta catch up. I uh, like. I'm. I'm enjoying it. I. I mean, I'm a huge Jodie Foster fan. So anything that she is in, I'll. I'll probably enjoy. Oh, I loved it, and I really commend them on. You know, much of the cast was indigenous and just. Just you know, there was so it was. You know, you just get you. You get transported to a place and a time, and um, and then the case was fascinating, and the characters are fascinating. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I've gone no, off on a tangent here because well, you remind a, me of Pryor. We're getting a little free. We're getting a little free promo uh, for our uh, for, for our bosses there at WB. Um, <laughs> but oh, that's anyways. right. It is part of our company. There you go. Yeah. Why can't we have Jody on the show? Vertical <laughs> I'm sure integration. Jody Foster's here. <laughs> dying to be on the podcast. Yeah, she loves to talk about crime. Um, <laughs> that'll do it for this week's comment section. As always, you can leave those over on our YouTube community page. You can also reach out to us anytime over on uh, all the usual channels, Facebook, X, if you call it that, uh, Instagram, wherever you want to reach out wow, to us. Wow, you finally said X, Will. I've been waiting months for you to accept the change. <laughs> only here, only here. Um, I don't want people to get confused with my old terminology. Uh, <laughs> and anyways, we did a great show last week. If, if any of the listeners haven't caught it yes. yet, uh, focusing on issues uh, with animal cruelty cases, we got a couple of great guests. If you haven't checked that one out, Highly recommend it. Um, until next week, that'll do it. Thank you all so much. Bye, Will. Yeah, that um, episode we did last week is an amazing episode about two cases. And so many of you reached out to me personally uh, and shared that you couldn't listen, you couldn't watch because you just cannot bear to hear of an animal being mistreated. And I completely understand that, but so many of you have been grateful that we did tackle it because it doesn't get enough attention, not only just in general, but from police. And that's why we did the podcast. Uh, two cases, um, one of which you probably all have seen that viral video of the woman holding onto the hood of a car as it's driving through downtown Los Angeles because the people in that car, she says, had just stolen her French bulldog. The French bulldog is still missing. One arrest has been made. Um, we're watching that case. But that this is an interview with the woman who jumped on the hood to save her dog. So if you if you can do it, it's a, it's an amazing episode. Um, an amazing episode. Rachel, what are you up to? Where can people follow you? I know I turn on TV. There you are. Uh, <laughs> how can people know um, what you're talking about? 
Well, I'm also available on X at RL Fizze and um, can always find me on my firm website at zfzlaw.com. Excellent. It's always a pleasure to have you. We always love, um, you know, everyone who comes on this program has a different perspective from the law enforcement community or the justice community or investigative community. And that's what I love because every week we get to hear things and see things through a different lens, you know, and that's what makes it possible to look at a crime from all angles. So I am very appreciative of you joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you on. We can't wait till you're back again. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great. Uh, you can find me at Anna G News. Yes, I am on X. Uh, Anna with one N. And, you know, Instagram, Facebook, wherever you can find me. You can find this episode, all our episodes, wherever you get your episodes, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, we're there. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is more than 5 million strong. And we um, love the comments on YouTube because it's the one forum where we can all have a conversation about the cases discussed in the podcast. So it's one of my favorite places um, to connect with all of you. And then you can sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>